All right, we might make a start uh, while everyone's filing in. So hello everyone, welcome to this session. So I'm Sam Stranks, I'm a University Assistant Professor at, in Energy at the University of Cambridge. Uh, and I'm gonna talk today about some of the work we're doing in our research group uh, and work that's going on in many other groups around the world on, on halide perovskites, particularly for uh, photovoltaics and lighting. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll encourage you to, uh, to put questions into the Q&A along the way. I'm gonna, I'll, 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 I'll give you an overview of the, of the topic and, and the subject, and then at the end we'll have time for the questions, but please do put them in as, as we go along. Uh, so um, I want to start by just giving context to, to the potential of, of solar power and solar photovoltaics. And if you think of this cube representing how much sunlight is hitting the Earth at any one time, so 200,000 terawatts, then this represents our global power demand. Uh, so you can see, uh, uh, I'll just see if my point is coming up. There we go. Um, so you can just see how much potential solar power has to uh, has to you know cover all of our demand. And in fact, if you look at our current PV installations, it's just, it looks like a tiny speck in. Uh, it, it's it's just under one terawatt. And this is a lot of PV, and we're doing very well in, in terms of deploying a lot. But it does show that we still have a long way to go. Um, one of the exciting things really that we've seen is that, that solar deployment is growing very fast and, and you'll see that solar panels going on rooftops and solar farms and this is fantastic we need this for decarbonization and so this plot is showing uh, the projections that the International Energy Agency uh, puts out each year this is these are showing these different colored plots here and of how much solar power is, is or how much uh, sol yeah, solar photovoltaics have been deployed and the, the black data here shows what's observed and what's actually deployed. So what you can see is year after year consistently, they under predict by a long way how much solar could be, uh, is, is going to be deployed in, in the given year. And that, that, that trend has continued and continues still today. So this just shows us how fast we're, we're, we're putting it out. It's faster than, we, than uh, the IEA could actually predict. And the reason for this is that the, the cost of PV, particularly the module price has dropped significantly over the last uh, several decades. So we've seen a factor of 100 times drop since 1980. And in fact, another factor of 10 drop in price uh, since 2010, which is staggering and really is, what, uh, is what's driven this, uh, this, this, this rapid deployment. And this has been really due to two things. One is that uh, economies of scale, as, as more volume has been produced, as more panels have been produced, as cost reductions in, in the materials and the manufacturing, uh, but also R&D efforts, so research and development, which means that the power conversion efficiency, so how much sunlight um, we can convert to electricity, how efficiently we can do that, that's been improving uh, consistently as well. But the, the problem is the current PV technology, so those that we rely on and really dominate the market, and I'll talk about that in a few moments, uh, these won't get us all the way there, won't get us to the, to the levels that we need to get significant decarbonization Almost every uh, every decarbonization model puts solar photovoltaics as one of the uh, one of the really leading energy sources that we need to rely on. Um, and so, just in terms of what the limitations are, the current technologies. One is that the, it's not just the cost of the panel itself. So, if you think about the panel, but there's there's also the system. There's all of the other things. There's the installation, the wiring, the inverter. Um, these are called the balance of systems costs, and these costs are, are, are much harder to bring down. And in fact, this is a plot showing the, the cost of modules, so photovoltaic solar modules uh, over in, in Germany over sort of the course of around a decade. You see the module cost has dropped, and that's actually continued to drop. But then there's these, these other costs, these balance of systems costs, which are now, in fact, dominating the system cost. And so this is much harder to bring down unless there's a really big, for example, big efficiency jump uh, in, in, uh, in the performance. Um, another issue is that, that most of the PV panels that are made today, they're made of crystalline silicon, and these, this uh, is, 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 you need very high temperature to process silicon to ensure there's no defects and, and problems with the, with the cells. So this means that factories gen tend to be very expensive to build, so there's lots of very high capex associated with building new factories to, to make more solar. Uh, and there's also issues because there's only a few places geographically around the world that manufacture these panels, so there's been particularly through COVID times and also more recently, there's been supply chain and also geopolitical issues. So this is really limiting our ability to, to really hit the levels that we need to hit to, to reach decarbonization. And in fact, those levels need to be something like a terawatt per year deployment by the end of this decade, which is actually 
in fact, more than we've produced to date. So that just shows the scale and just how much PV we need to produce. Um, so these, these issues are limiting the rates of deployment and also potential applications as well, because silicon is quite bulky and, and it limits what you can do. And I'll show you in a few moments uh, some of the, the other opportunities that can come with, with other materials. Uh, so what we need is we need other solutions with, with higher efficiency, more modularity to do more things with it, reduce costs, and also new manufacturing paradigms where we could manufacture at much higher throughput and, and at much lower cost. And I'll talk about a lot of that uh, in, this, in this talk. Um, so nice the current technology on our space, I mentioned the crystal and silicon is what we see. So when you look on yep, any rooftops, you, the majority of panels, 95% of the market is crystalline silicon, these sort of blue looking panels here. Uh, it's a very good technology. It's been developed over Getting many, nice many decades and it, it will last for a very long time on the rooftop. So, it's, uh, so it really has come a long way. Uh, and if we, if we unpack this PV, PV module, and, and PV system, what we see is that, um, sorry, my mouse is, is a bit a bit clunky. Uh, on the left, you can see this, this is the cells that we make the, the silicon ingots that cut into to make cells. And that's shown on the left there, that's um, a wafer of silicon. And then these cells are strung together to make a module. Uh, and then typically, so that's, that's, a, that's a panel. And then in many solar arrays, these modules are then uh, joined together to make a solar array. Uh, as you can see in the middle here. Uh, there's another uh, slightly different technology, the thin film technology, I'll talk a bit about that today, where it can be produced instead of in small cells and, and, and when you limit it by ingots, you can produce one big panel in one production step. And so if you, if you look at a PV panel, these, these solar cells and, and, and the module is then encapsulated with, typically with, with glass and other encapsulation aid, uh, materials so that they can be protected from the environment and last on your rooftop for, for, for 25 years plus. Uh, in, in terms of how a solar cell works, so if, if this is here where we're, if we're, we're, we're looking at a cross section of a solar cell, so we're sort of cutting it in half and looking at the side of it. And so in, in its most simple form, what you have is that you have something that absorbs light really well. So this a solar absorber layer in the middle, this is this black layer that I've got in the middle here, and that's sandwiched between two electrodes, an anode and a cathode, and if we shine light on it, what happens is that, that absorber layer absorbs the sunlight and that energizes electrons. And those electrons, once they're energized, can then be transported through the cell and be collected as current. And this is the, the, the principle of how, how the solar cell works. That current, we generate both photo current and also photo voltage. And that means because we've got both current and, and, and voltage, we're generating power and that can drive an external circuit. Uh, and, it, and there's one, uh, one other subtlety to uh, when we energize electrons, we actually, what we do is we leave behind that where we leave behind where that electrons come from, there's actually uh, a particle called a hole, which is left behind. And that's a positively charged particle. And we have to also transport that to the electrode as well. We have to consider transport of both the electron and this hole. So if we, if we run this, if we absorb light, we energize these electrons and holes, and then they uh, are collected as current and then they drive an external circuit. So for example, this, this light bulb here, I'll play that one more time just to, to run that through. So these uh, electrons and holes are transported. So what we need for a solar cell materials, we need it to absorb light very well. And we also need it to be able to transport these charges really well. They're, they're two important criteria. And along the way, those charges may hit things like defects or, or traps where they, those electrons could lose their energy to heat, for example, and those are unwanted things in the system. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about that towards the end and some of the things we're doing to address those issues. Uh, so when we think about uh, solar cells, we think about the solar spectrum. So here, this is actually uh, what the solar spectrum looks like as this is looking at the wavelength. So it, it peaks somewhere in the green, uh, but there's lots of light in the near infrared which is also coming in, and we ideally want to harvest as much of that light as possible. Uh, there's, uh, this is what the spectrum looks like on Earth. You have some absorption from the atmosphere, from, from water molecules and oxygen and various other things. So that, that's why you have these, uh, the, these small dips here. But that's the solar spectrum, and that's what we, we want to maximize how much light we can harvest in that spectrum. And so when we, when we think about our solar absorber layer, we need to think about uh, how we can absorb a lot of this light. And these, uh, the, these are semiconductors, so they have what's called a band gap. So that we have to energize electrons across that band gap, give it at least enough energy to uh, energize across that band gap. 
So often when for, for a solar absorber, when the infrared light comes in, we don't have enough energy to energize those electrons. And so in fact, that light isn't absorbed and, and then that's, uh, that, that then transmits through the cell and isn't, doesn't contribute to produce electrical power. Uh, but on the other hand, if we give it um, high enough energy light, so blue light, for example, we have more than enough energy to energize that electron and that is then energized and now is in the conduction bands and now it can conduct really well. And then it's conducted to an electrode and collected. And meanwhile, if you recall, I mentioned about this hole, that's also collected in the other electrode. So this is the working principle of the solar cell. We want to maximize how much light can be absorbed. Uh, there's a bit of a trade-off because we want this band gap to be uh, as small as possible so we can harvest as much light as possible, but then that, well, that impacts our voltage. So there's a bit of a compromise where the actual efficiency ends up being uh, some compromise between the two. So we can't have too small a band gap uh, in the end. Uh, but that brings me on to the perovskite materials. And this, this is, these are the materials that we're working on uh, in, in, in our labs. And so the perovskite family of materials, actually it's a huge family of, of, of materials and it's anything that takes the crystal structure ABX3. So when we think about the atoms and the, or the ions and how they're arranged in these materials, they can take a, an ABX3 crystal structure. This is actually named after calcium titanate, which is a, it's a naturally occurring mineral. Uh, and there's many, many different perovskites in, naturally occurring many minerals in fact it's one of the most abundant material families in, in the earth's crust but the materials we work on for solar cells and for lighting these are these are man-made versions they're, they're, they're uh, the compositions aren't those that we find naturally so typically we have uh, when we think about the a site here and and so or just just to look at this crystal structure what we have is we have a essentially we have an octahedron of of this, this B metal sitting at the center, and then these X sites, the, the X sites is around an octahedron. And then we have these little A sites sitting at the corners of these octahedra. Uh, and so when we, uh, when we think about the solar cell materials, at the A site, usually we have small organic cations. These are small organic molecules that, uh, that, that contribute here, uh, or cesium as well, cesium ions. Uh, in the B site, the, the metal, we, we have typically a, a cations such as lead or tin uh, and in the x site we have halide ions so iodine or iodide or bromide typically and so these are the typical absorbers uh, or, or emitters that we are working with uh, and the reason they're creating a lot of attention is because of their efficiency in solar cells we're seeing huge improvements over a very very rapid short period of time uh, and so this is a plot that shows the power conversion efficiency of solar cells so this is looking at how much sunlight energy is converted to electrical uh, energy. And, and this is over the decades, you can see silicon there is uh, it's improved gradually over, over many decades and uh, partly because of developments in semiconductor chips as well that have contributed here and also just uh, very good R&D that has contributed to these, uh, to these improvements. Uh, but you can see the perovskites since the first reports in solar cells in 2009 have really shot up. And in fact, now they're just as of the end of, uh, at the start of this year, in fact, they, they've hit 25.7%. Uh, and it's likely that they'll, they'll approach the value of silicon perhaps even, even later this year, which is a really exciting, uh, really exciting time. Uh, and one of the reasons they're particularly exciting from a scientific point of view is that we can, we can process them very crudely and, and at, at low temperature. If you remember, I told you how uh, for silicon cells, they have to heat them to very high temperatures to get rid of defects. With these perovskites, they seem to be very tolerant of defects. We don't have to heat them very high. Uh, and this, this is, in some ways, it's very counterintuitive that we have defects in these materials, but they can still work very well. It goes against what we, what we're typically, what we typically teach, that we, to get, make a very good semiconductor, there has to be very crystalline with very few defects. These perovskites actually, in some ways, are rewriting that the textbook in that, in that regard. So when we process these materials, what we do is that we typically have inks of these, uh, we dissolve the salts, the precursor salts that make up these, uh, these, these ionic materials. And we're, um, so in the center here, I've got uh, an image of this ink being dropped down onto a, a glass substrate. And then we spin coat them in the lab at a few thousand RPM. And this forms a really nice and, and uniform film. And you can see in this yellow image on the left here. And then we heat them gently. So we heat them at 100 degrees Celsius, which is very low temperature for uh, for semiconductor processing, silicon, for example, is, is more like 900 to 1,000 degrees Celsius or, or, or more, depending on what you're processing. Uh, so this is very low temperature, but it produces a very nice 
crystalline film that absorbs light very strongly. And this is the basis for uh, the solar cells that we make. And because this can be done at low temperature, it means we can think about uh, processing them on plastic, for example, or on other flexible substrates and processing them at, at much higher throughputs than processing reel to roll to roll, for example. You can think about a bit like newsprint, uh, a newsprinter and really printing them at very, very high rates. And this is actually an example of a, a prototype uh, roll to roll printer of perovskite cells. We can see on the left here this the yellow of the precursor films, and then, and then they're, they're gently heated and they form this. The, this, this deep brown, uh, very dark absorbing uh, cells on, on the right there. Uh, and because, yeah, as I said, because they're, uh, they can be processed on, um, on, on flexible substrates, they, we can make very, very thin cells and they also absorb light really, really well. In fact, much, much better than silicon. So for example, as a silicon cell, uh, typically we need to have a thickness of something like uh, 200 micrometers or close to 200 micrometers to absorb enough of the sunlight. Uh, a micrometer um, is, is a thousandth of a, of a millimeter. So this, this is already quite thin. But then when we go to some of the other thin film technologies, we see this is one which is cadmium telluride, which is four micrometers. But when we go to perovskite, we only need 0.5 micrometers to absorb almost all of the instant sunlight, which is ex extremely thin. For reference here, this is a, a human hair, which is 100 microns. Uh, and a red blood cell, which is seven microns. And this perovskite cell you can see is, is extremely thin and that's enough to, uh, to, to absorb, or absorb the sunlight. And this means that we can make extremely uh, thin and flexible and even lightweight uh, solar cells, which I'll, I'll talk about in a few moments. We can also change the, the properties and, and tune the composition. So we tweak the, the composition of these materials. We can actually change the color that they absorb or that they emit. And so this is an example of if we move, if we, if we have a pure iodide, if we think about the halides, if you remember I talked about one of the components being a halide, this is the iodide, and we can mix in a little bit of bromide, we can actually change the color all the way around to, for example, this yellow, which is a pure bromide system. And this, so this opens up applications in color photovoltaics, for example, so we can uh, integrate these into buildings and actually design them to, to, to into the facades of buildings, for example, and this is there's a big, uh, a growing area of this building integrated PV um, where this can be very applicable. But when we, because we can change the color, one of the really, and I think one of the most exciting uh, opportunities for these cells is actually to, to push the higher efficiency. And so I, I talked briefly about that there is a compromise to, for an efficiency limit. And in fact, that efficiency limit for just one absorber ends up being around 30% or so the thermodynamic limit for a conversion of, of the sunlight to electricity. But we can do a, a, a trick where we can actually layer two cells together. So this is what's called a tandem solar cell, where we have a, a top cell, which is harvesting the bluer wavelengths. So the, the, the blue and the, some of the green gets absorbed by this top cell. And then the red wavelengths pass through to the bottom cell and they're absorbed uh, in the bottom cell here. And these, these work in series. So actually this, this combination here pushes the, the, the efficiency limit from something like 30% actually to more like 50%. And this is a huge boost in, in terms of performance. Uh, that's the thermodynamic limit. When we think about practical efficiency limits, that's more like 35% for these cells. Uh, and that's, it doesn't sound like much, but when you compare that to uh, silicon, which has a practical efficiency limit of around 28%, that's actually a huge improvement, a huge increase uh, in, in terms of how much power is generated over the lifetime of a panel that would last for several decades. Uh, and also given the knife edge economics of, of PV, it's a, it, it'd be uh, very much a game changer to, to produce uh, cells that are this efficient without adding any extra cost or, or adding, even having cheaper cells. Um, one other, just to mention one of the slight variations of this is in fact actually putting a perovskite cell on top of a silicon cell. This is also a tandem cell. So we're here that the perovskite cell absorbs the blue wavelengths and then the red wavelengths pass through to the silicon cells. So here you can think about boosting the, the efficiency of the current technologies. And so you could get something like uh, an efficiency boost from uh, modules today that are around 20% uh, efficient, perhaps up to 25 or even 30% efficient as, as a full module. But this, uh, so the, this high power that you can get with tandems, so you can also combine this with lightweight. And this uh, this actually opens up a number of applications for PV that just can't, aren't possible with, with silicon at the moment. So thinking about flexible solar cells, 
Uh, and this is actually some work that we're commercializing. I'm a co-founder of Swift Solar, commercializing really high performance tandem uh, perovskite cells. Uh, and so this opens up applications in this sort of wearable PV, but also cheaper installation regimes. So what we can think about rolling out uh, rolls or, or, or spools of PV, which is much cheaper to install on rooftops than without having to, to rack them, for example, uh, on rooftops. Uh, there's also applications in space and also area of communications, which is both a, a, a growing areas. Uh, but one of the particularly, uh, I think, uh, important applications is, is in electric vehicles, so boosting the range of electric vehicles. So here, uh, a requirement for putting PV in a rooftop is, is to make sure you're not adding much weight. So really, the, the watts per kilogram, how much power, electrical power you can produce for every kilogram you add of the panel is really important. And, and these flexible, uh, lightweight, but, but high-performance cells can be really, really important here. Uh, and so, in fact, that if we think about the range of, uh, of, of electric vehicles and how much we could boost, so typically you could get a, a boost in range of about 30 miles, for example, uh, which, is, which is a typical commute for many people uh, with one of these high-performance cells. So this will be a growing area as well as, as these technologies progress. Uh, so there is some commercialization happening. Uh, there's uh, several companies that are now in, in, pilot, in, in pilot phase in, in, uh, in, um, and actually have pilot lines to produce uh, PV cells and even moving to larger manufacturing lines. So Oxford Photovoltaics, for example, has 100 megawatt line in Brandenburg in Germany, and there's also microquantum semiconductor in China has a large manufacturing line as well, similar uh, to 100 to 200 megawatts. Uh, there's some products coming out of solar technologies in Poland, just to have a few examples. And our company Swift Solar is starting to produce some products as well. So this it's a really exciting time to see this technology, which has started in the labs, now really coming into uh, into be to be commercialized. Uh, and the other part I want to talk about this talk is actually uh, lighting and LEDs. And, and it, um, in fact, an LED is actually just in, in a solar cell run in reverse. So instead of uh, in a solar cell, we, we have sunlight, we put light in, and we get electrical power out. Uh, in this case, we're actually putting electrical power in, and we get light out. So it's, in fact, actually, uh, we can run a solar cell in reverse, and it can act as an LED. Uh, and so because these materials actually absorb light really well, they also emit light really well. And so the, the, um, there's lots of very interesting applications in, in LEDs and in, in lighting. Lighting is also a bit another part of our decarbonization that we need to address. Uh, um, lighting does contribute to a lot of carbon emissions. So for example, 5% of worldwide greenhouse gas emissions are, uh, are from lighting alone. Uh, and so these are some examples of some these perovskite different inks that we can make of different colors. We can tune, again, using changing the composition or, or moving to nanoparticle type systems, we can actually change them to have different emission colors or, or uh, either as, as solutions, as inks, or as, as films. And we can put electrodes on these and operate them as LEDs. And these are a few examples here of, of blue and green LEDs where there's some really quite uh, efficient operation, um, which is quite an exciting application area. Uh, and because one can make very high color quality LEDs uh, in each, with each color. This opens up a lot of applications in displays, for example. So um, you will have seen OLED displays, for example, they're using organic materials. Some of these perovskites could actually even surpass those in terms of the color quality they could produce because they have very narrow and very sharp color uh, emission spectra. Uh, and also flexible, again, some of the properties I, I talked about before, these, uh, these properties can uh, translate over to uh, um, to LEDs as well, and also very uh, efficient and more modular white lighting. A lot of LEDs at the moment, the white light they produce aren't, isn't that nice. So here you can, we can actually uh, fill that gap and really make very high quality white light. So I've talked a lot about the, uh, the, the promise of these materials, but I really want to also emphasize the challenges, of course, that facing these materials, they are a new technology and they it does take time to develop these technologies to make sure that they're not only commercial, but they also hit the, the scales that they need to hit to contribute to decarbonization, for example. And so these are some things that we're working on in, in our lab and others around the world are working on as well to, uh, to, to, to really push these materials along. Uh, I'm gonna talk, just give a few brief examples of, of three of these. And, and there's of course other areas to work on as well, but I've, I've just highlighted three uh, today. So one is how do, we, how do we take these efficiencies to these limits? I talked about this 30% limit or even with tandems up to, uh, to, to above these more traditional limits to 35% plus, for example. 
Um, a lot of the, the work we do in the labs, they're, they're at small scale. We, we make prototype cells that are, that are sort of one inch square, um, a few centimeters by a few centimeters, for example. Um, how do we push these across the larger area as well, uh, and, and particularly towards even the module scale? Uh, and finally, one of the really important things, how do we make these devices reliable and long lived? At the moment, the, the benchmark for silicon cells is 25 years, and, and many of them will last for longer than that. Uh, so it really, uh, it means there's lots of industry standard tests that have to be done to validate these materials. And uh, in fact, a lot of them are being done, and there's a lot of promising uh, early stage um, testing on this front, but there still needs to be a lot more done uh, on this. This is one example here of a, of a test where this cell was run for a thousand hours under continuous operation in uh, simulated sunlight and elevated temperature. This is to mimic, for example, how it would, how it would uh, operate on a rooftop. Uh, and some of these cells really take, are really surviving a lot of these tests. And so that's a very good validation that they're on the right path. Uh, so this is in terms of uh, what we do in our group. This is our, our group based in uh, the Chemical Engineering Biotechnology Department here in Cambridge. We also have labs in, in the Cavendish Labs in, in physics as well. Uh, so we're uh, a mix of expertise. So we, uh, we're physicists, chemists, material scientists, chemical engineers, electrical engineers. So we have a wide range of, of expertise. And this is uh, really needed to when we're working on things that span from materials development all the way through to to physics, uh, to characterization and advanced characterization, and even through to engineering devices. So it's a, it's a really, uh, we have a great mix of, of, of expertise in the group. We, we uh, as, as any uh, group that works with light, we always have a, a ground state and excited state photo. So this is us in our, in our excited state uh, uh, here. And one of the particular things that we, we work on is, is we use laser, uh, laser light and optical spectroscopy to try and understand how these materials work and where these, if there's, for example, defects that, that contribute to power losses and, and therefore how we could remove them. Uh, so here, this is some examples where we, where we, where we shine light, very fast pulses of laser light to, to energize these electrons. And then we watch them. Uh, we, we can look at things like the light coming out to watch how fast these carriers recombine, how fast they lose their energy or how fast they're collected at, at electrodes. So this is very important information to understand how these cells work and how we can make them better as well. And so one example is this is some work, um, in fact, some of the earlier work in, in the perovskite field, looking at how far charges can travel in these materials. If you remember back to the cell I showed you at the start where we sandwich between electrodes as absorber and we need to collect those electrons in holes. So a really important parameter though is, is how far these charges can travel before they lose their energy to heat. Because that tells us how thick we can make the solar cell, for example, or how we, if we need to design the device in a different way. So this is some work where we were, uh, this, this is looking at cutting a, a perovskite cell in half and looking at a cross section again. And what we do is we excite, we, we put a pulse of light in at the bottom and with a very fast pulse that's 100 picoseconds, uh, which is, um, which is um, a, a thousand billionth of a second. So very, very fast. Um, pulse of light and we watch the light coming out and so we can look at decays over time so this is looking at the light over nanoseconds so over billion billions of seconds how that light um, how, how these carriers decay away and when they decay away they, they emit light uh, and so we can model that using a diffusion equation so we can these charges diffuse around and from that we can extract how far they can travel because how far they can diffuse uh, and what we found is that they can travel micrometers in these materials so when we excite them here, this is, you can see a scale bar here. This is a, a, um, about half a micron in thickness. It means these charges can easily traverse that distance and be collected at an electrode on the other side without losing their energy to heat. So this allows us to design them in very simple ways where they're just sandwich structures between electrodes. Another thing we do is we zoom in on these materials. We use microscopes to look, use, to, to look at the optical spectroscopy of these materials again. Uh, and so, um, this is a solar cell put, in, put, in under, put under the microscope, and you can see the perovskite solar cell in particular, and you can see that these, these cells, are there, these materials are actually made of grains. You see these grains are making up sort of a mosaic pattern. That's what you see here. And the, the color on this map is actually the, the light coming out. So when we put light in, now we're looking at the light coming out. And that, that gives us important information because where we don't have much light coming back out, that means that a lot of, uh, so these, in these dark regions, my, my mouse is a, 
bit slow. You can see in these where the arrows are pointing in, in, in these darker regions, uh, this is where we have lots of losses, lots of power losses because we have carrier traps. So these energized electrons fall into traps and then they lose their energy to heat. And so they wouldn't contribute to, uh, to the solar cell power. So what, whereas there's other regions that are really bright and, and luminescent and, and that's good. That means we have very few defects in those regions. So this tells us that we need to <clears throat> we, we need to design the, the, the devices or the materials so we have a uniform and bright image, ideally. And so this is a good technique to be able to assess how good these uh, how good these devices are. Uh, we can also do some some very interesting techniques where we can actually put them um, really under the microscope and 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 again excite with a, a packet of laser light. And then what we can do in these experiments actually is look at uh, these these charges trapping in real time, and so this is a really really cool experiment where we have this, this is actually in an, an electron electron microscope, and we can actually see in real time in real space, but with um, nanometer almost nanometer precision, we can see where these carriers are, are losing their energy to. And so I'm going to play a, a movie. So this is in picoseconds, so really really fast time scales, and when at zero picoseconds the light comes in and excites these carriers. And what you're seeing in the dark regions here, are these, these are the carriers trapping in the material. These are, these are traps that, uh, where they're losing their energy to heat. And so this is a, a really, really powerful technique to, to, to really delve into the nanoscale and see where these materials are losing their power. And so what it tells us that, is that we need to remove these, these, these sites, these, these sites where you have these dark, dark regions. Um, we can also do, use electron microscopy techniques to uh, to understand why they trap in certain regions. And this, this is some work we've been doing where we, uh, where we can identify these, these, these traps, so these losses. So this is on the left here, this is a, uh, an image looking at these grains and, and there's that little blue spot you can see at the center here. Um, that's a, a, a trap state that we can identify um, using these techniques. And what, what we, can, we can look at the, uh, the crystal structure of these grains. So if we look at the crystal structure of the grains on either side, you can see that one of the grains on the bottom there is actually, uh, it, it's pristine. So when we uh, look at the diffraction pattern of, of how, when we, when we send electrons through, how these electrons interact with the material, we can actually tell what the crystal structure is of these uh, different regions. So on the bottom there, it's, it's something, it's a, it's a pristine grain, so it's perovskite that we would expect. But on the top there, that pattern actually is slightly distorted. So we actually have a, a grain that's more defective and it's at that junction where these uh, where these where these carrier traps form. They, they they form in clusters. And so this is really interesting. It tells us it's really these little tiny locations which uh, which will be important. Uh, and these are actually important not just for uh, not just for for carrier trapping, but also for um, for degradation of the material. So as we operate the solar cell over time and operate under sunlight, for example, for very, many many uh, many many years, for example. These tiny little sites that that trap charges are also sites that where we start to lose our material impact. And so this is some experiments where we can see. So the yellow shading is uh, these the, these sites that are problematic and and they're slightly different structures to the perovskite. When we look at them in an electron microscope before and after lots of light, you can see lots of the, lots of changes to the material at these sites. And in fact, this is we actually have material being lost here. And eventually you form, they form little pinholes. So you actually lose the material entirely. And this is of course not good for long-term operation of a solar cell. We need to get rid of these. So th this is telling us a lot of information about how we can um, understand these cells and then how we, can, uh, how we can improve things. And so speaking of improvements, this is, this is some work where we are trying to improve these and, and we're looking at um, different additives and post-treatments of the films when we make them to, uh, to, to produce um, a better luminescence map. So you can see on the left uh, before and after these treatments, for example, you can see it's much more uniform. It's much more, much more luminescent as well, which is what we're seeing in the color here. So th this is improving things and removing some of these problematic, uh, problematic traps and defects. Uh, and then the other, one of the other topics I wanted to talk about briefly was on scaling up the devices. How can we make move them from a sort of small area in the lab up to, to much larger area. And so some work we're doing is, is uh, not just using solution to process them, so using inks, but actually using vapor methods where we 
where we actually have the precursor salts and we actually sublime them onto the substrate. Um, this is called thermal evaporation. So we heat them gently and then they, these materials uh, form very uniform layers on the, on the substrate. Um, and this is a, a technique that can give us very, very uniform films. This is an example here of, of, a, of a flexible film with, this is a 10 by 10 centimeter example here. Uh, and it's very, very uniform. So this is a technique that is very scalable and could take these cells to much larger areas as well. And finally, I, I want to give an example of, um, I, I, I told you about space applications and how these materials can be really interesting for, uh, for, for using them in space. And one of the really important things to test for these cells is whether they would survive very high energy proton in bombardment, which is what we see in space. We're very lucky on Earth that we won't be seeing that. Uh, but, but in space, these cells will see this. So it's really important to, to do checks to see that they do survive. And so these are some experiments where we actually bombard with protons, very high energy protons, these cells. And so these are proton doses that, <clears throat> that are equivalent to 50 years in an ISS orbit, International Space Station orbit. So really a very long period uh, and very high rates of bombardment. And when we look at these tannins, this is a particular type of perovskite tannin. So you can see it's very, very stable and it doesn't degrade uh, after a very high dose of protons. Whereas if we look at something that has silicon in it, it's a perovskite silicon cell that degrades very quickly. So we can see this, these are the, we see losses in, uh, in the performance parameters of these cells. And that's because silicon, uh, when you produce defects, that really does kill the cell performance. Again, that's why you have to heat them, uh, produce them at very high temperature. Uh, so this shows that, that these perovskite cells are very, very promising for, for space applications and particularly for, uh, uh, for, for, for very long-lived uh, cells in space. Uh, I want to finish by just saying a few other applications that we're working on in the lab beyond lighting and beyond solar. Uh, one of them is actually looking at X-ray them for X-ray detectors. So these materials, um, so but they absorb light very well, but actually if we make them very, very thick, they also attenuate X-rays very well as well. We can actually use them as X-ray detectors for medical imaging, for example. And these are some of the really growing area and something we're very excited about to make very high resolution uh, X-ray detectors that could be a lot cheaper than, than the current systems. And also quantum devices where we can make um, <clears throat> very small nanoparticles of these materials and these can actually, um, we can produce things like single photon emission where, where we just have one photon emitted at any one time. And this is essentially a, a, a building block for a quantum computer. So these materials could be very uh, interesting for some of these applications. Uh, and finally, we've got a project with uh, the Center for Global Equality and, and Bahi Dar University in Ethiopia to, to develop mobile solar water pumps using these perovskite cells. So here we have a very, uh, the goal is to have a very lightweight module, PV module that can be moved around, for example, moved around a farm to different bore, boreholes to, to pump water out. Um, at the moment, a lot of water is pumped manually, so this can really alleviate a lot of these, uh, a lot of these issues, and particularly for the farmers in, in, in Ethiopia. Um, just to finish, I want to um, give a call out that you can meet, meet our team. So we're, on Saturday, we're hosting uh, uh, in the Department of, of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology. We've got, uh, we've got a stall here where you can actually come and make your own solar cells, making cells, in fact, from berries and from juice. So it's, a, it's, a, it's good fun. So please do come out and have a chat with us and, and visit us. So it's, um, you can register here and it's running uh, on Saturday from 10, in fact, to 2. So please do come along. Uh, and kids are, are, are very, very welcome. It's a lot of fun for, well, for kids and adults. So please do, do come along. Uh, and I want to finish with some, uh, a charity um, organization, in fact, that spun out from our lab, uh, recently founded to uh, produce uh, teaching modules and, and teaching uh, materials for, for teachers for, for primary school age children to teach around not only what climate change is, but also some of the solutions to climate change. So some of the things that we're working on in terms of solar technologies um, to really inspire kids that there is that there are solutions for this and to really get them engaged in this. And there's some hands-on experiments and other things that we've got. Um, we've rolled this out already to uh, around 10 schools around the country and um, we'll be delighted to, uh, to expand that further. If you're interested in finding out more, please do contact us. There's an email down the bottom left there. In fact, we're actually uh, hiring at the moment for an outreach officer. So if, if you're interested, please do uh, get in touch. Uh, so just to, to finish, uh, these payload perovskite materials are, 
really the idea is these these could take the baton on the current technologies on silicon for example there's we, we we can't stop production of silicon we need to make sure we keep rolling out as much pv as possible as quickly as possible to reach decarbonization goals but as these other technologies like these perovskites come along they can really feed in and boost this effort and that's really um, where the power is in, in these new technologies uh, the reason they work so well is they absorb light well and they transport energized charge as well and that's and that's really um, some of their key uh, features there's uh, they can be processed at, at low temperature and very high throughput so this really does open up new new manufacturing regimes and there's some some of the first products emerging but uh, there is still there are still challenges and there's still work that needs to be done both in academic labs and industrial labs to really push them forward and, and to reach their full potential uh, so with that thank you very much uh, to well to my group it's a pleasure working with some brilliant people here uh, and uh, collaborators around the world as well, and also funding agents. And uh, I'll be happy to uh, take questions and, and to discuss more on the topic. Thanks very much. And so I think there's been some questions coming in. Thank you. And, and please do continue to, uh, to, to put questions into the Q&A and we'll start working through them. We've got some from our team uh, on board as well. Uh, who'll be helping to, to to manage the questions and make sure we get to uh, to everyone's. All right, so I'll start looking through the questions. Um, so I think there's, so there was a question here on um, what do you think about the role of chloride as one of the halides apart from improving film quality? Do you see any potential applications of pure chloride-based perovskite cells, um, for example, in Internet of Things applications? Uh, so yeah, very good question. Thank you. So uh, I talked a lot of, about iodide and bromide, but there's also you can put chloride in these materials as well. Uh, these the, the chloride in particular opens that band gap up further, so you move to, um, for example, much more blue emission or even UV emitters. Uh, and so there, there could be some very interesting applications in uh, in emission using chloride-based perovskites, particularly for blue LEDs. That's one of the much more tricky. Uh, tricky colors to, to work with, in fact, and that has historically been the case in many different technologies. Uh, and also, poten yeah, potentially for, uh, yeah, potentially for light harvesting in indoor applications where there's, where you need more, there's more blue to harvest and you have less of the near infrared. The tricky things about chloride is, is with the perovskites that they don't form as well in terms of the films and the performance. A lot of these, the defects that are there, they seem to be more problematic. So that's, there is a challenge there. To, uh, uh, to implement them. Okay, so a next question. So are, are there any long-term failure or wear-out mechanisms which need to be resolved before this technology can be widely deployed? Uh, yes, and thank you, very good question as well. So yes, in the short, there, there are things that still need to be worked out. And hopefully I, I gave you a flavor of that through some of the work we're doing. Uh, yeah, so the cells at the moment, they're not ready to last for 25 years on the rooftop. They're, there has been some very good demonstrations of at least multi-year, uh, one to two year uh, um, uh, uh, testing of the cells, but it lasts that long. One of the issues is we haven't yet been able to test them for long enough to know how long they last. Uh, and the second is that um, what has also been the case for other PV technologies is that there's failure mechanisms that, that only really come up multiple years into, the, into their lifetime. There are different failure mechanisms that, that we may discover as things go along. So there is, we do have to uh, continue to test these, particularly with accelerated tests, where we can really try and mimic many, many years of, of, of operation with elevated temperature, for example, or, or elevated sunlight levels to really try and mimic uh, a very long lifetime. But there's still, still some issues to work out, hopefully over the next few years that we'll be able to get rid of these. Uh, okay, so there's a question on, uh, how long is the registered charge trapping, uh, detrapping in, in picoseconds? So, so very good question. So the, the trapping process, so if you remember that video I showed uh, earlier on, um, the, the actual trapping process, so how long it takes for a carrier to re-energize and then to trap, um, it's less than 100 picoseconds. It's something somewhere around 60 picoseconds or so. So it's a very fast process if these traps are there they will uh, the, the, these carriers will see them and, and will hit them okay uh, so yeah so there's a question on 
yeah, how long would it take to, to for market reality? How long would it take for um, so Proscott, Proscott, Canons? Uh, well, I think yeah. So this yeah. For, so first of all, yeah, how much time does it take to, to hit the market and, and to really hit the market? It's a very good question. So the the, the first that I, I showed a couple of examples of uh, pilot lines and manufacturing lines of, of companies that are starting to produce the first products. So uh, it's I believe Oxford Photovoltaic, for example, are um, have this year earmarked as, as their first products coming out. Those are perovskite silicon candles, where they're perovskites on top of silicon. Uh, but of course, they'll start, you know, of course, at, at smaller scale. How long before it hits, you know, really, I suppose, how much before it competes with current silicon technology? The reality is it's probably five years before it hits, you know, serious volume and probably a decade before it really gets to the volumes and the costs that, that really properly compete with silicon. Um, so the, these timescales are compatible with what we need for these new technologies to come online, um, but we do need to accelerate them as, as fast as possible. Uh, okay, so there's a, a question on what is your range of predictions for solar power installed by 2030? Uh, very good question. So what we, well, what we need is we need that rate to be around a terawatt per year by the end of the decade. Uh, that that's very ambitious. That's something that I, I hope we can still hit, but it does mean a, a very large increase in, in the rate of deployment. Uh, I think we'll, we're about to hit the first terawatt, and that's a very important milestone in in terms of PV, uh, in in terms of how much we've deployed. Um, but it, you know, the next terawatt has to come quicker than than it has so far. Um, I, I think we'll be hitting at least another terawatt, um, or, or possibly even. To two to three terawatts by the end of the decade, and that would be a very good thing. Um, but that's still probably not enough. We do need to be doing more than that. Uh, okay, so there's thank you for the questions. Keep bringing them in. So there's, uh, yeah, so there's a question on how perovskites really scalable as they have lead, which is toxic, and other metals which are not as abundant compared to silicon. Uh, so, yeah, good question. So, first of all, on, on the lead, so that, uh, so yes, they, they do contain lead. There's when, when we think about the, the amount of lead. Uh, in these materials, so if you they have very extremely thin film thin materials, uh, in fact, it's an extremely small fraction of of lead, uh, extremely small absolute amount of lead, uh, and even actually if the if the whole panel failed and all of the lead washed off into the soil, it would still be well below the safe uh, it would be well below the safe levels of of, of lead uh, in the soil. That's not to say that this doesn't need to be considered. This is it's very important. It does, and in fact, what is most likely going to be very important with these technologies is in fact thinking about the whole life cycle of them and having uh, so so being able to really package the cells well so that they don't fail and if they do if they do fail and, and um, that the lead can be captured and, and doesn't leach out uh, and also thinking about end of life where do they end up at the end of their life and it'll be really important to think about recycling uh, and, and recovery um, models for these as well um, an interesting some interesting progress has been made on this. There's, there's some very interesting developments on uh, lead sequestering agents on these cells. So putting things like lead sulfate, converting to things like lead sulfate, so that when when the if the cell fails, for example, the, the lead is quickly immobilized and is not soluble, for example, and therefore uh, won't even get to the soil. So there's some really advanced engineering processes that can actually mitigate a lot of these issues. Uh, in terms of the um, in terms of the uh, uh, um, elements that are there. So all of the, the perovskite absorbers, they're all earth abundant elements. That there's, there's no issues in that sense. There's, uh, in some of the cells we use ITO, indium, for example, but there's no reason for that. So indium is, is very scarce. That's something that will be a problem. Uh, also for the display industry, in fact, that uses a lot of indium, but uh, that, that's, that's not necessary. That's, that's for the, for just for a, thin, a transparent conducting oxide. We can use other alternatives and there's some very interesting uh, alternatives, for example, carbon-based alternatives as well. Um, so that's not an essential element of the cell. Um, okay, so a question on, uh, yeah, so on Swift Solar, so from a business perspective, uh, I'm interested as to why you set up Swift Solar in San Francisco and not in Cambridge. Um, this is a very good question. So I, um, uh, I was, in fact, before my position in Cambridge, I was at MIT in the US, and in fact, we, we uh, the founding group actually got together there. There was some of us at MIT and some of us at Stanford, uh, and um, and that was the right place to start it. So we ended up starting it in 
uh, in California. We actually did a lot of work at NREL as well in, in, in Colorado, which is where the National Renewable Energy Labs are. So there's lots, lots of good infrastructure there. Um, we also found there's, there's it, at least um, from an investment point of view, there's, that there's good appetite for hardware investment in the US as well. So it was a good environment uh, for that as well. Uh, I'm still quite heavily involved, even though I'm based in Cambridge in the UK. And um, we have obviously a lot of our research group. What we do is very relevant, but I also am quite actively involved as an advisor in the company as well. Uh, a little bit harder with the time difference, although with, with, with the COVID times, things moving online actually made it, uh, made it compatible uh, with, with working there. Uh, all right, so, uh, so there's a question on which of the slides that you showed about the effect of defects on the performance of the device. Could you please explain more about what, what type of defects particularly affect charge traps? Um, and, and so, the, for example, the, some of the data I showed showed a distortion, but can we actually say what type of defect it is? Uh, that's a brilliant question. Thank you for that. It, um, it's quite different. So what we can see, we can see in these materials that we see, uh, we see a certain structure, for example, that is not perovskite. That doesn't tell us that we know what type of defect that is. Um, what we have, we, we work closely with, uh, with theory collaborators who, who can model the ele electronic structure of these materials. And they, for example, they can perturb the crystal and, and see how that would affect the, the different states that are there in the material. Uh, and what we believe is that these, these slightly distorted structures, these different phases, for example, they actually have very high defect densities uh, of particularly what's called interstitial iodide. So we have an iodide that's sitting in between the lattice, in fact, in between the atoms. And that, if we have an iodide sitting there, that introduces states uh, in the band gap. And that's, that's where these, these charges are trapping. That's what we believe at the moment. That's the, 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 sort of the leading thought. Um, it's still very difficult to experimentally verify exactly what type of defect it is because it's very difficult, especially in these small regions, to see uh, an iodide uh, defect itself. Um, we're starting to actually push towards some more atomic scale uh, imaging as well, which is we're hoping to be able to see more of these uh, directly. Uh, okay, so there's a, yeah, another very good question on what do you think is the main limitation for perovskite LEDs to reach the market? And this, yeah, this is a very good question. Uh, I talked a lot about the commercialization of solar cells and perovskite solar cells, and that's uh, partly because the, the solar developments are more mature. They, they started earlier, and the perovskite LEDs are really probably about five years behind the PV uh, developments. One of the really real issues with LEDs is you have to run uh, very high currents through them. So especially if you want to get to high brightness of an LED and much higher, for example, than the currents in a solar cell. And so this is actually quite an issue because when we run very high currents, um, we do get some degradation processes that happen. And um, things like when we run lots of current through them, we have ions that can move in the material as well. And these can lead to uh, more defects and also to degradation pathways. So, so it's a, it's a, it's, at the moment, it's, it's very tough. A lot of these LEDs are really, um, the perovskite LEDs typically last for minutes. There's been some reports of hours, but we're not hitting you know, the tens of thousands of hours that LEDs would be rated for in, uh, in, for, from commercial technology. So there is still a long way to go. I think there's still a big challenge of how to solve when you run high current through these materials, how to stabilize them. And that's something that I think, I hope over the next few years that we'll make some good progress on both in our lab and, and, and in other labs around the world. Um, okay, so there's a question on what are the factors that determine VOC? So, uh, and, and maybe, so if, um, if we think generally about solar cells, so that the open circuit voltage is, uh, it's a key parameter in the solar cell, it's mostly dictated by the band gap. So as, as you go to a wider band gap material, you get a higher voltage higher open circuit voltage. If, um, if you remember, I talked about the compromise that we want to make that band gap lower for current, but higher for open circuit voltage. So there's some compromise between the two. Uh, the things that affect voltage, particularly are these defects. So when you lose the energy of the electrons to heat, that lowers your open circuit voltage. And in fact, that's um, when I showed those maps where you have little dark spots, that um, directly impacts the VOC. You have a, a drop in the VOC because of that. Uh, okay, there's a question on how near do you feel you are to plateauing for improving the performance of perovskites? Uh, yeah, another good question. So 
when you look at the efficiency charts, the, you know, it certainly has slowed and that's understandable because we're now pushing towards you know, you know, very high values and, and not far off the limits. Um, I mean, I think that we, we still are seeing increases. I mean, it's, it, you know, in the last year, it's gone up almost a percent in absolute terms. And, and I think we'll see probably another, I think another percent over the next year, maybe over the next 18 months. So um, I, I wouldn't say, so it, it's slowing, but I wouldn't say it's stopping yet. It's not fully plateauing. Uh, in the tandem cases, the tandem efficiencies are still lower than they could be. Uh, I think there, we've, the, the trajectory is still a bit higher and we will still see uh, further increases there as well. Uh, okay, so there's a question on, uh, well, well, yeah, what do you think is or would be the limiting factor in terawatt scale deployment of perovskite modules? Uh, and yeah, another good, very good question. Uh, so, I mean, to hit terawatt scale, well, first of all, for the perovskite technologies to, to compete, they, they will need to sh be shown to, to last, you know, for at least decades. And there's, there's certain models that show that even, even five to 10 years will be enough needed for market entry. Uh, so, there's, so there's that aspect that they, they do need to hit R&D milestones before, um, before we're really seeing them at scale. Uh, in terms of the terawatt scale, so provided the specs can be met in terms of efficiency and, uh, and, and stability, for example, and reliability of the cells, uh, there's actually very little stopping it from hitting very high rates because factories can be built faster, they can be more modular, you can have smaller scale factories even in more places. It does open up a lot of, uh, a lot of very exciting opportunities to very quickly um, ramp up, uh, provided these R&D goals can be hit first. Uh, okay, so there's a so there's a question of do you see any future of solution process perovskites given the current solvents are not allowed industrially, or do you think the future lies more in thermal deposition? Uh, very good question. Um, so yeah, so traditionally some of the uh, some of the solvents that have been used, so dimethyl formamide, for example, some of these have been uh, can be quite toxic and they're more difficult to use industrially. Uh, there are some very interesting, much more as they call green solvents being used and, and, and adopted that, that are looking very promising. And there's a lot more work going on in that space that, that these sort of these solvents that are much more green and much more environmentally friendly and less toxic are um, starting to hit very good efficiency values as well. So, so I think from that perspective, I, I see solvents can be, uh, solvent-based processing can be very competitive because this also opens up things like slot die coating and, and even inkjet printing of these cells, which is um, very scalable and, and can open up a you know huge area, uh, but in terms of yeah solution versus vapor, it's a very interesting question. That at the moment, different um, different companies are following different avenues, and and both seem to be viable. So I wouldn't say there's a clear answer right now. And in fact, I would say both would be viable, uh, and and may appear in different places. Vapor can be useful if you're processing on something that you can't use solvents on, for example. Uh, um, but but I think I would say the jury is still out on which which might win out. In fact, in many ways, both. Both are viable. Uh, okay, so there's a question on yeah, which type of perovskite material uh, you think will strike the market in the future? So this is there's some different compositions, so methyl ammonium lead iodide, or ammonium lead iodide, or, or other mixed ones uh, would strike the market in the future. So yeah, very good question. There's uh, the in the earliest days of, of the perovskite solar cell mostly used the methyl ammonium cation. This one's quite unstable in fact, and a lot of the earlier cells were unstable because of this. Uh, the more recent configurations and those that are really hitting the highest efficiency levels, these are using formamidinium lead iodide or, or mixtures of formamidinium and cesium. And these are much more stable and much higher performing. Uh, I think these will be much, uh, yeah, the, those will be the future of the cells, particularly the formamidinium lead iodide systems. Uh, I don't think methyl ammonium is gonna be uh, is, it will be thermally stable enough to really be commercially viable, uh, although there are still cells that are working well with that configuration as well. So I would say the form of systems or, or, or slack mixtures often will, will be there. Um, okay, so I think uh, we're running out of time. Maybe I'll take one last question. Uh, so there's a question on what, what are the mitigation approaches to have stable perovskite devices? Uh, yeah, very good question. So this is when we're thinking about uh, stabilizing the absorber layer. So if you remember, I showed uh, 
Uh, I showed some of these small impurities that are really problematic. And there's some very promising additives and, and passivation approaches that can mitigate defects. So these are uh, chemicals that we can we can add that either uh, convert these unwanted phases to other things, or that that um, that can interact with these iodide, iodide interstitials and, and make them benign. Uh, these seem to be a very promising way to get rid of uh, get rid of these traps, but also stabilize these cells as well. Uh, but yeah, so I think going forward, there's going to be some really interesting uh, work to, to to really stabilize some of these, to really get rid of these small impurities that I've showed. Um, that and and they'll need to be not only sort of got rid of in the lab, but also on the manufacturing line. If we're making roll to roll huge sheets of these, then we need to be able to, uh, to get rid of them even on on the large scale. Okay, so I think we've hit time. So th I'd like to say thank you very much, everyone, for for coming along. I hope you, know, you enjoyed that. Please do come along on Saturday to to meet us, and to chat more, uh, and uh, or, or or send us an email. Um, and thank you those who. Who put in questions? Okay. Very interesting Super questions. interesting. Yeah.